This is Professor Gawardis, and I'm here with Professor Foster, and uh, we're going to be talking about the production code and the gangster film today, the evolution of the production code, how it came to be, and how it affected the gangster picture. So, America has always been a Puritan country, and I think a good place to start is, you know, who were the Puritans, and what were they... <clears throat> what was their issue? What were they in vain against? And, uh, you know, King Henry VIII uh, split off from Rome and started the Church of England. This is Westminster Cathedral next to the Parliament Building mm -hmm. in London, uh, which is clearly a uh, statement of a state religion. Um, why did the Puritans think that, uh, um, that the Church of England had lost its way? Well, the reason for that was uh, Henry VIII at the time, he was asking for uh, another divorce, and uh, the, the reason for that was that he, he was unable to produce a male heir, uh, which was going to end his, uh, his reign. And so he wanted to break off and create his own thing so that he would be permitted to have as many divorces as he could have. So, in other words, he, he didn't really leave the Roman church. He just had this one issue with it. Exactly. But they kept all the trappings exactly. of the church. And speaking of the trappings, this is how Anglican priests dress today, uh, indistinguishable from Roman Catholic exactly. priests, aren't they? And quite ornate, too. I mean, it, it's, so, it's so grandiose, the way their, their presentation uh, uh, is to the public. You know, all the, all the symbols of power, the orb, the cross, all of that, uh, and very much uh, something that disturbed the Puritans. Now, this is an image of a Puritan church. Big difference from the Roman Catholic Absolutely. and the Anglican church, right? Yes, the, 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 the contrast is quite vast. There are no symbols, there are no statues, there is uh, no... Uh, idea of, uh, in a sense, what they called idolatry. They they didn't believe that they should be praying to a statue. For them, uh, the Bible was the direct way for them to communicate uh, with God, and all that came because of the uh, <coughs> the uh, press and uh, the Gutenberg Bible that started this all. Before that, as the Bible was uh, in Latin, not many people were uh, able to to read for themselves, so they needed a a mediator, specifically the church, to help them understand the uh, what was written in the Bible. But now it was as if they were directly communicating through God, and they felt that all they needed was within it, rather than the implementation of the rules and and uh, traditions that the church, this the, the Anglican and the Catholic Church were bringing to them. And, and in fact, uh, Puritans' uh, services were quite informal. Uh, anybody mm -hmm. who felt the spirit. Mm -hmm was moving them, uh, was uh, able to get up and express uh, their experience to the entire congregation. One of the first books written in American literature, you know, is Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, The Scarlet Letter, uh, and the heroine of the book is this woman, Hester Prynne, uh, who had an affair with the village priest, and uh, he got away with it, but she was forced to be shunned for the rest of her life. Yes, uh, he, she basically was, um, uh, not physically, but spiritually and, and existentially excommunicated from the community. Uh, she would walk around with the letter A on her chest so that everybody knew that she was the adulteress uh, and that uh, she basically did not live on the same level as everybody else. And uh, the, obviously the, um, the village was taking an interest in enforcing the code of morality, exactly. wasn't it? Exactly. And that's, that's one of the things that's probably at the heart of Puritanism. Exactly. All right, well, let's, let's fast forward to the 1870s now. Uh, this man is named Anthony Comstock. Uh, he came from Chicago, and he was very interested in this whole idea of imposing a uh, morality on the city of Chicago. He was particularly upset about the fact that you had all these young immigrant guys coming in from Italy, Ireland, all over Europe uh, to work in the slaughterhouses of Chicago at that time. And uh, he um, got first-hand chance to observe their immoral behavior, at least immoral from his point of view. 
Uh, one of his favorite things to do was to follow young working class men through the streets of Chicago on payday. Payday was always Saturday mm -hmm. night. And these guys worked six day weeks and 12 hour days. And uh, they you know, wanted to blow off a little steam and maybe meet a prostitute. And his, his practice was to always make sure that they were ap apprehended by the police. So Anthony Comstock, though, became a leader of an organization that kind of crosses the lines between church and laity. And that's something he uh, got the Chicago churches to agree to take a part in, right? That's correct. And uh, he, he became, eventually became the <coughs> uh, uh, postmaster general where he was in charge of uh, what was being circulated through, through the post. In essence, the, uh, the, the, the Comstock Laws of 1873 uh, stated that any obscene material, which was open to interpretation, but most of it dealt with anything that had to do with uh, abortion and things like that, were not permissible to be circulated through, uh, through the post. And, uh, and the takeaway from that is, is that this is the first national scheme uh, for enforcing morality, and uh, it does pave the way for other schemes of a similar type, doesn't exactly. it? Of, of course, of course it does, and as we'll see, this leads directly to what the cinema does in the 30s. Well, this is an image of uh, women uh, marching down Fifth Avenue in New York City, uh, and uh, they're uh, marching on behalf of the idea of women's suffrage, and you know, um, the uh, federal government uh, hadn't acted on it. All those, you know, some states already had women's vote. Uh, and when we talk about suffrage, we don't just mean the vote, by the way, because that's a little misleading. Uh, women weren't allowed to own real estate. Right. They weren't allowed to sign contracts. Um, there are all kinds of things that they weren't allowed to do without the franchise, which is probably a better way to put it. Uh, and uh, so now we're in the 1920s. Uh, and um, a million people, by the way, watched this demonstration on Fifth Avenue. Um, so obviously the spirit of America was changing. Um, what, what do you think um, caused America uh, to be ready for um, this change in women's rights? Uh, I think a lot had to do with we were just coming out of the First World War, uh, so things were changing around the world. Uh, and we had we had lost a lot of service members. I mean, on the continent of Europe, and uh, things were moving rapidly. Uh, there was a change in also the the way people were dressing in the European countries, specifically Paris and France. And uh, Americans felt that maybe possibly they were lagging behind. Now, uh, p previously to this, we also had the Civil War in the United States, and that had given the the rights to all the freed slaves. And so women. They were definitely next in line, if if not earlier. Uh, but although they were not the last to get the vote, actually the the last people to get the vote in the United States were the Native Americans. Correct. And uh, so, but this is this represents a tidal wave of change in America. Now, what does this have to do with cinema? Well, the the reality is that cinema always reflects the spirit of the times, and so we're going to see that happen in the cinema of the early 1920s. Is, is that both of these political movements um, hit pay dirt. And in 1920, um, we had um, two major um, uh, additions added to the Constitution. Uh, the amendment which provided for women's suffrage and prohibition. That's correct. Uh, and prohibition uh, would become the stuff of lots of great gangster movies in the days to come. Okay, so, um, you know, speaking, you, you mentioned that uh, European fashion was now coming to America as a result of World War I, and this is a great example of, uh, of the new fashion of the time. Uh, and if you recall the images of the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union or the Women's Suffrage uh, Marchers, you know, they're all kind of dressed from head to toe. Yes, yes. Um, it's and, that Victorian style in a way, still. Yeah. And uh, this style is really different, isn't it? Absolutely. You can see legs, you can see ankles. I mean, the, the, the dresses are just barely below the knees. Uh, and they have a lot more fluidity and, and movement in their clothes. The, the fabric is different. Uh, they're, they're not hidden, basically. They're, they're open and their bodies, I feel, feel more free. 
And just a couple of more examples <laughs> of uh, women's attire and the changes now. You know, they called it the Roaring Twenties. It's also mm -hmm. called the Jazz Age. Right. Um, and um, it's uh, a period in time that the movie's really celebrated. And you can see why. Visually, um, it's just much more interesting than what had preceded. And here's another example uh, depicting the fashion at the time. Uh, clearly, this is also coming into the art and as Dr. Foster said previously, this has to deal with the zeit zeitgeist, and uh, this gets represented represented in the in the forms of uh, media and and culture. And as mentioned before, the the clothes are quite loose fitting, uh, and it it goes along with uh, how the women, I believe, are feeling also psychologically. There's a sense of freedom uh, to the expression of their bodies. Uh, the music has changed, and this is the flapper age, and it's one of those things where you see quite often during Halloween, some people dress up as flappers, and it's just, there's there's a certain glamour and, and uh, uh, joy to it, I, I feel. It's still in fashion in many respects. So, moving on to uh, cinema's treatment of uh, femininity and women's suffrage, um, we start to see um, images in the cinema of the fallen woman uh, and the femme fatale a little bit later on. Women who use their sexuality to control men and uh, who um, don't really follow the codes of morality that had been set up in America over the centuries that came before. As presented here by, by this individual, uh, there is smoking, there is drinking, and even the, the physical stance in this image, how she's downtrodden in a way and that's basically uh, conveying this idea of lack of morality and what causes to the, the psyche of the uh, of the individual. But she also has a really determined look on her face, too. Absolutely. Probably a very interesting character. This image is Clara Bow, uh, another one of these very popular actresses uh, during the 1920s. Uh, and uh, she played a character that was often called a vamp. Now, what's a vamp? Uh, a vamp is, is somebody, as you said before, uh, who uses their sexuality to control men, uh, and they ha they exude this uh, sensuality that is basically just completely uh, irresistible to to men. It's one of those things where it's a it's a high, and they just have to follow it, and they fall prey to whatever uh, she may have in store for them. And of course, Mae West, um, one of the biggest stars of the early talking picture era. Uh, had really risen to fame in New York in the nightclub and uh, the Broadway review world. And, uh, you know, her act was basically telling dirty jokes and singing dirty songs. That's correct. And she had, she had a show called Sex, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. I think so. And uh, she actually uh, is the actress who caused Cary Grant to get hired by Paramount. Uh, because they needed somebody to perform opposite her, mm -hmm. and uh, he was kind of the hunky guy of the day. And they brought him in for she done him wrong. That's right, right. right. And uh, so, uh, even though Mae West had a very short career in films, uh, it was uh, really left a big impression on the entire cinema industry, including her platinum blonde hair, her Marcel look, um, the whole the whole presentation became uh, kind of an iconic way of portraying women in cinema during the, during the 20s and on into the very early 30s as well. Pictured here is Will Hayes, and uh, he was hired to be the commissioner overseeing uh, the idea of what the content of a movie was going to be after a very big scandal that we've already talked about. Right, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, uh, 1921. Uh, in December that year, um, Marcus Lowe and uh, um, the uh, head of Paramount, Adolf Zukor, uh, got together and decided that they should do what baseball had done a couple of years previously. Uh, in 1919, the Chicago White Sox um, uh, at the uh, behest of a famous gambler named Arnie Rothstein through the World Series. Uh, they hated the team's owner, uh, Kaminsky, uh, and, uh, who was a 
total cheapskate. They, when they were on the road, they stayed at crummy hotels. They didn't eat well. Uh, and uh, so when Rothstein uh, pitched them on the idea of throwing the World Series, they were all in. Well, the problem is that came out. One of the players, Shields Joe Jackson, uh, was a real Christian kid, and he just, just his conscience got the best of him, and he let it be known what they had done. Uh, and to respond to it, uh, the baseball um, owners got a guy named Judge Kenneshaw Mountain Landis to be the first commissioner of baseball. And he was given carte blanche uh, power to clean up the game no matter what that meant. And uh, so uh, he, which he did. Uh, and uh, so the movie business now is looking for somebody who can do that for them. Although they don't really want to give any power away, and they're making a lot of money making movies that are somewhat questionable. Right, so they replicated the same system that the uh, baseball league was uh, using, and so, as you mentioned, they gave the bully pulpit an empty nest to this man <laughs> named Will Hayes. Right. Will Hayes had been the postmaster general during the Warren G. Harding administration, and uh, he um, was uh, considered to be pretty impeccable in terms of his credentials. And so they set him up with a big office and a big salary. Uh, his office was on Broadway in New York City, halfway between the Paramount Building and the Lowe's Building, uh, which means that both guys could keep an eye on him. And uh, they encouraged him to talk all he wanted to about how good and clean the movies are since he's gotten his job, but they don't give him any real power. So Will Hayes, while he was in power of the MPPDA, the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors Association of America, uh, it was just a, uh, a uh, facade, really. He wasn't really doing much. And so this takes us all the way to 1934, when uh, the Catholic Legion of Decency comes uh, with an ultimatum to Hollywood saying, you need to actually control the content, because nothing's changed since the, since the implementation of Will Hayes into the system. And so we bring into the picture Joseph Breen. Now, Joseph Bream had been uh, involved in the Catholic Church. He was the president of the Knights of Columbus, which is a men's fraternal organization within the church. He also was the head of PR for the Peabody Mining Company, uh, owned by the Rockefeller family. Uh, and uh, he had, uh, uh, one of the things that they had done was they had called in Pinkerton detectives to break up a strike, and uh, the detectives uh, set up 50 caliber machine guns and mowed down the picket line, including women and children. Uh, and he was the guy that had to explain why it was necessary to do this. So he was kind of a thug himself. And he's put in Hollywood in charge of enforcing a code of censorship that had been created uh, actually by, for the Archbishop of Chicago in 1930. And all in the name of morality so that we would prevent uh, movies from lowering the standards of, of uh, uh, people. Now, we're going to talk about some of these uh, rules that they had to come up with. Now, this image here is not the rules that were put down by uh, the censorship. This is, in fact, a uh, image satirizing the rules and trying to break them. Now, what were the rules? One of the first ones is no methods of crime or sympathy for criminals. Right, and uh, probably aimed at the Warner Brothers who had basically geared up to be making uh, gangster movies when they hired James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson. Uh, and uh, so let's talk about a few of the rules. Uh, that's the first rule, by the way, uh, is the anti-gangster gangster movie rule. Uh, just about every other thing has to do with the things that uh, were criticized about the movies, such as um, the, uh, s the movies that had um, portrayed people who were having adulterous relationships. Uh, you know, by the end of the movie, the man's got to lose his fortune and the woman has to die, preferably giving birth to their bastard child. Right. The depictions of sex have to uphold the sanctity of marriage. And uh, also about um, the whole idea of what can you put on screen in terms of uh, shooting a scene of passion. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, the Hollywood studios, they were the ones that had to figure out what these rules meant, by the way. There was no guidance on them. And uh, so uh, this means a new kind of kissing scene uh, where we're going to uh, basically film people from the shoulders up. So no matter what their hands are doing, uh, it's not visible to the audience. Uh, everybody's tongue has to stay home. And a kiss can't last longer than five seconds. And so literally kissing scenes kind of disappear from the movies uh, for several years. And uh, another one was delicate locations. Correct. And Hollywood took that to mean bathrooms and bathtubs. And so we don't see any uh, bathrooms for quite some time, not until we see the very first one in 1960 in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. So it was a big moment when we see a toilet being flushed with paper in it, by the way. And it was like, whoa, there's a toilet on screen. This is crazy. (laughs) And uh, also bedrooms were considered a delicate location. Uh, And so uh, if a married couple is portrayed as sleeping together at all, they have to have twin beds. And uh, most often we see married couples sleeping in separate bedrooms because it's just easier to deal with that. And uh, so uh, that's just some of the many applications. There are about 20 in all. uh, And um, they were really behind times when they were put in place for the first time. But Joseph Breen, uh, every script had to be submitted to him before it could go into production. And every finished film had to be submitted to him again to make sure people hadn't cheated on the code. And so he had a stranglehold on the business for a long time, really until 1942, when the Office of Wartime Information is created uh, in support of World War II. And uh, they create another office in Hollywood called the Bureau of Motion Pictures. And now every script has to be submitted to the BMP before it's submitted to Joseph Breen. So now if you find something objectionable in a movie um, after the BMP has looked at it, it's going to seem anti-patriotic. And so he starts to become very careful about what he does. And uh, the production code had stayed in, uh, in effect... Um, really uh, until the mid-50s, although Will Hayes retired at the end of World War II in 1945, uh, and uh, the, uh, one of the main Supreme Court decisions that made censorship possible, uh, the Mutual versus Ohio decision in 1915, was overturned in 1952 by the Ver- Burston v. Wilson decision, uh, which does something really strong because they invoke uh, the Near versus Minnesota decision from 1932, uh, which uh, says that you can't uh, use prior re- uh, restraint uh, in uh, restraining the movies from censorship. So, in other words, uh, submitting a script to Joseph Bream uh, breaks this prior restraint. And uh, so uh, Breen's power really goes away, but he still doesn't retire until 1955. Uh, But he wasn't replaced, and so there's nobody to censor movies anymore, but there's a committee that meets and either awards the production code uh, to movies that are decent, uh, and everybody has kind of learned the rules of the game by then. In uh, 1955, though, Otto Preminger made a movie that broke all the rules. It's called A Man with a Golden Arm. And Frank Sinatra plays a guy who's a heroin addict in the film. Uh, Now, one of the rules was you can't show drug use, period. Even to show how harmful it is. And uh, so um, the uh, movie was de facto uh, not decent. And... uh, Preminger didn't bother to to apply for a a code ruling on his movie. He just released it without it. And what he does is he shows the way to everybody else. But it still wasn't until 1967 that the code goes away once and for all, uh, thanks to Jack Valenti. Here we have an image of the production seal of approval that would appear in the beginning of a film. Uh, so that meant that you had gone through the process of having your film sub- submitted, first your script, then your finished film submitted to Joseph Green's office, and who had looked it over and deemed it worthy of being 
uh, something that could be released in the movie theaters. In fact, movies could not be shown in movie theaters, for the most part, unless they had this certificate of approval. So what Premiser had done was he had broken this very basic rule of the movie business, and he got away with it. And uh, that really opens the door for other producers. So since 1921, we had in place this idea of the code, although it wasn't really enforced until 1934 with, uh, with Joseph Breen, and it was enforced kind of through the mid-50s, late-50s, but after that, it was kind of defunct. It existed, but people weren't really following it, and as Professor Foster mentioned, uh, Otto Preminger with his film, The Man with the Golden Arm, really set the standard for how to move forward. But in 1967, the... Uh, MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, now that it, has, it had come to be known as, uh, had a new president, Mr. Jack Valenti, and here he is pictured. And so when he comes into power in 1967, when he takes on the role, let's not say power, uh, he had these two scripts on his desk uh, for two brand new films that were very much inspired by the French New Wave. One was Bonnie and Clyde, and the other, The Graduate. And so he has a decision to make as to how to proceed, whether to uh, make these movies, and how would you do them, because they had a lot of sexuality, violence, and other concepts in them. So how he proceeds is that he decides to uh, call on the board of directors and to have a talk with them to overhaul this old censorship system and to create something new. And they uh, created a rating system in place of the censorship system, uh, and a very simple one at that. G, R, and X. G for general audiences, R for restricted audiences, and X for adult. Uh, and by the way, it doesn't, by adult, we don't mean like pornography. Uh, the picture that won the uh, Best Picture Oscar in 1969, Midnight Cowboy, was released with an X rating. But eventually, um, even that simple system uh, encounters some problems. And during the era of mainstream pornography, um, we get uh, the newspapers are having a lot of complaints from people because on the movie pages in the paper, you've got uh, the ad for Herbie the Love Bug, the new Disney movie, on one page, and the ad for the new porno movie, Debbie Does Dallas. Um, and on the next page, and people complained incessantly about it. So the MPA got back together one more time, and they tweaked it uh, with three levels of G. Uh, R stays intact, and now the X becomes NC-17, and uh, it actually requires movie theaters to card people who they suspect might not be 17, and the movie theaters refuse to do it, and so that's why you don't see NC-17 movies. Um, the real genius of the system, by the way, is that it's open-ended. Uh, you can go back and appeal your rating and uh, communicate with the committee that's uh, actually screened your film. In 1931, the Warner Brothers, through the Vitagraph, uh, directed by Merwin Leroy, they, they released Little Caesar, starring Edward G. Robinson, who's going to play the character of Caesar Enrico, or Rico, uh, who is really modeled after Al Capone uh, during the Prohibition era. He's got the Tommy gun, the, 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 the girl who's the mall, uh, all these things that are taking place in this gangster picture. This is the Scarface uh, poster, the original Scar Scarface from 1932, directed by Howard Hawks, produced by Howard Hughes. And uh, it deals with the story of uh, this gangster who rises to power uh, during the Great Depression era. Now, the title of the film was also Scarface, The Shame of the Nation and The Shame of a Nation. So this is clearly a social message picture in a way, even though it's full of action uh, in the film. Now, Paul Muni, who plays Tony Camante, the Scarface character, um, it has a kind of an odd relationship with his sister, uh, Seska, who's played by uh, Joan Dvorak. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of like, like a, you know, kind of like what I would call sexy behavior in the film. George Raft, by the play, way, plays uh, uh, Tony Camante's sidekick in the movie. And it's just a really good gangster. It's got a great uh, drive-by shooting sequence. Oh, yeah. Uh, that has been emulated quite often. 
So the prohibition in the United States uh, begins in the 1920s, 1920. or 1920 exactly, yeah. and it lasts all the way to 1933, and this was a nationwide constitutional ban on the production, importation, the transportation, the sale, and the consumption of be beverages. And uh, actually, it was the prohibition didn't end really until 1934, because um, the whole idea of uh, distilled beverages was still a little bit in doubt. They hadn't been any made legally in America for quite a while. Uh, and uh, so that had to get sorted out. So it was really about halfway through 1934 that uh, you can legally buy a bottle of whiskey in America and consume it. Uh, and uh, that was America's one big experience with trying to uh, constitutionalize morality, and it was a colossal failure. And this all brings us to the film, The Public Enemy, uh, that we're going to be screening, starring James Cagney, Gene Harlow in one of her early roles. Uh, but James Cagney really uh, carries this film on his shoulders. Now, James Cagney was discovered by Daryl Sanic at uh, Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. and so he had this amazing energy to portray characters on, on screen. But to connect this to the idea of the Great Depression and uh, the uh, uh, age of prohibition, this movie will deal with the concepts of the prohibition. In fact, James Cagney's character is going to become a gangster who is going to be dealing in the importation and dealing of uh, 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 alcoholic substances. Right, and uh, it's a... Um a film that actually has a very sociological take on uh, the gangster film. We're going to meet Tom Powers when he's get Cagney's character when he's 10 years old for the first time and then see him grow up uh, on screen. And uh, so it's a, uh, it's a film that's meant to really deal with this issue of, you know, what makes these people so, um, you know, so um, ruthless in their uh, constitution, in their actions. And uh, so it doesn't make excuses for Tom Powers' character, but it explains him, at least. Right, the idea that hoodlums are, are uh, created, not born. Uh, and uh, just a small note here, this is the example of one of the Warner Brothers pictures in the gangster genre, and this is the kind of film that the production code was going after to, uh, to nail films like this so that they would not be produced because they felt that they were eroding the morality of American youth.